But, contrary to what it looks like outside, it is still Easter season. Believe it or not, it is beautiful, and any moment, the flowers are just going to burst into bloom. I just, I have hope in my heart, guys. <laughs> it was beautiful last week, um, but today it's not, but that's okay. We still have beauty in here, and beauty as we gather together to worship the Lord today. As we sing our first song, we're going to relight the candles that we lit on Easter Sunday. Uh, these are going to stay here throughout Easter season just to remind us of this beautiful light that was brought into the world by Christ that we have in us, that we are shining to the world as living biographies of Christ. And we've had some pretty amazing examples in this church this week of being living biographies of Christ. And we might hear about that later. And if you want to, you can go on the Facebook page and hear a little bit about that also. But I invite you to stand. We will sing loudly and hopefully bring the rest of the people up from Sunday school. And they will hear our beautiful voices. And join us in worship. Let's sing together. the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh his free
Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, worshiping with my family of believers today, and I welcome you. Let's continue in worship by reading together responsively from Psalm 4. Please read the parts that are in yellow. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you, my people, turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord appears when I call to him. Tremble. And do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord. Make me dwell in safety. Let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Easter season is a beautiful time to celebrate the peace of God with one another because we actually get to read over and over again where the risen Christ comes back to the disciples and says to them, peace be with you. It was clearly very important to him. And that is why we do this every Sunday before we come with our prayers and our offerings, before we listen to the word, before we come to the table we make peace with one another and with our Lord. So I offer you this blessing today. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's turn to one another and celebrate this blessing of peace.
Good morning, grace and peace to you. Welcome, family. Join me today, if you would, and let's say together our identity statement that we are a family of believers, broken by sin, bound together by God's love, on a spirit led journey of wholeness in Christ. Well, we're missing a lot of our family today, it looks like. So if you see someone who's typically around you who's missing, just let them know that you miss them today and maybe they're joining us on our live stream happening right now. If you are, welcome. You're part of the family too. There's a great event going on today after the service. Uh, We hope that you'll plan to stay with us for lunch. Uh, We are having a lunch fundraiser that is to benefit our youth and it's sort of a semi full service lunch, uh, sit down lunch. Tickets are $8 for adults, $5 for grade schoolers, and four and under is free. And it is chicken alfredo, salad, and a dessert. And you can pay with cash check or even uh, through our online giving link. Uh, and that's immediately following the service today. And then as we come to a close with our eating our lunch, there will be a pie auction, pie and dessert auction. And um, it, you know, you'll just have to take a look around and see if there's something uh, you want to make a bid on, and we'll do that live, and it'll be fun, and it's always a great opportunity to help our youth raise funds and get prepared for our camp season coming up here, as well as uh, NYC and a long-distance trip they'll be taking. Also, want to mention this Saturday is the Triangle 5K Run Walk. You see in the bottom inside flap of your bulletin that is put on by Cross Point Community Church of the Nazarene in the Bannister Road area. And it's a great way to see how a church is trying to impact their local schools and community. So I'd love to have you join Sally and I. We'll be out there and a few others will be uh, running, walking with us as well. We'd love to have you come support our fellow church there impacting the community. Other things there, I'd love for you to see in our bulletin and connect with. Uh, Also, there's a membership class we'd love to do if you know of anyone who's interested in membership. Just see one of of the pastors and we'd love to get you plugged in on that. As we continue in worship, let's stand together and read from our gospel passage from the Gospel of Luke in this Easter season that we still continue in today. Gospel of Luke, page 1061 in your pew Bibles. Luke chapter... 24, verse 36 through 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Gospel of our Lord. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time. As we move through every sorrow and trial of this life, uphold us with the knowledge of the final morning. When in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection. 
redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever freed to be your people. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the scripture reading. Thank you, Heather. It's wonderful to have scripture in the program. Pro, I guess it's not really. Anyway, uh, 1 John 3, 1 to 7. It's in your pew Bibles. Page 1229. Wait, oh, never mind. It's up there. All right. We're reading the New International Version. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me.
eyes closed, we enter into our time of family prayer. Pastor Nick is coming to lead us in our pastoral prayer time today, and I would invite you to find your posture of prayer today. I would invite you today to come and kneel at these altars if you'd like. You may come to the altar to your right for healing and anointing prayer. The altar to your left is available to you for whatever it is that you'd like to come and bring to God. Of course, as always, you can kneel where you are. You can remain standing. Find someone else in the sanctuary here today that you want to surround and support in prayer. Let's enter into today our time of family prayer together. Allow God to speak to our hearts today as we pray. Most holy, wonderful Father, I am struck by how you love us, by how you love me, that every person in this room, every person that we know and come into contact with, and so much farther reaching than that, every person you love extravagantly. morning I stand in awe that you would love <clears throat> even me. And so, Lord, I just say thank you. Thank you for how you love me. Thank you for how much and how deep, how beautiful, how powerful your love is for each and every one of us. And you demonstrate it so much, and we are so unaware. We cannot even fathom, we do not even recognize how much you love us. And Lord, it is my confession this morning that I have not loved you as I am called to. not loved you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and body. And what's more, I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we do not love you, others, or even love ourselves. Lord, we still come. We come broken, we come hurting, we come with great needs. We come desperate for your love, we come desperate for your presence in our lives. For some of us, we come with needs of physical, bodily needs. For some of us, we come with broken relationships. For some of us, we come struggling with finances. For some of us, we come with mental, emotional difficulties that we cannot bear on our own. But we still come, broken as we are, untrusting as we are. We come because we believe that you really are who you say you are. That you, you are God. I am not. Those around me are not. The people that I idolize, the people that I look up to are not. You alone are God. And you alone and do something spectacular about the needs that we bring to you. And Lord,
Lord, for those who are coming this morning. Who come maybe not totally understanding, maybe not fully trusting or believing. Lord, would you help our unbelief? Would you remind us that you really are who you say you are? That you love us, that you are for us and with us, that you work in the midst of us even when we don't realize it. May we always turn back to you. May we place all of our needs at your feet, knowing that you are good and that you are taking care of us. And Lord, we thank you for this community this wonderful gathering of saints who come here that we might know you better, but also that we could build each other up, that we can be a community, that we can be a family, though broken, united in love. We pray for the communities around us. We pray for our town, for our nation, for our world, and all of the chaos and all of the fear and the anger and the hatred. It feels like it is overwhelming. It feels as though it will win. And yet we stand on the other side of resurrection, believing that you have won, that you are risen, and that fear death, and hatred, and sin do not have the last word. So come, would you open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds to what it is you would say, to what you would reveal to us this morning. Remind us of your goodness, remind us of how much you love us and those around us and this entire world and how you are for it and you are at work redeeming the world, that you are reconciling all of us back to you. Help us to be aware of that, to remember that when the world feels darkness all around us. We pray now for our pastor, Steve, that as he comes to proclaim your good news to us, may you pour into him and speak through him to what it is you would have us hear. Lord, we thank you. Thank you so much for all the ways that you have been at work for all the ways that you are presently at work. And may we by faith thank you for all the ways that you will be at work in our future. So now, as one body, as your church, help us now to pray the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power for you. See what great love he has lavished on us. It's an opening phrase of the passage that we're going to hear from this morning. As the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings, 
I think that's an important thing to remember, isn't it? That God has lavished, what an amazing word that is. God has lavished his great love on us. And we have the opportunity through simple things like the offering and through singing and maybe even silly things later on today like sharing in the pie auction and doing little things to be able to help others around us. We have opportunities to respond to the love that God has lavished on us. I want you to hear this passage again. Just, I'm just going to read the first three verses of 1 John chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. That's the NIV version. The NRSV version, which I typically use, says we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But, what we, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves as he is pure. I want you to say that phrase with me that I just mentioned. It's, it's a different phrase than you find in your NIV version more than likely. But it's a phrase that I want you to hear this morning. And if you don't hear anything else, hear this. We are God's children now. Will you say that with me? We are God's children now. If you don't hear anything else today, this, this phrase sets us up for the remainder of our series in 1 John. You've got to be able to hear that. And I, I truly wonder if we hear that. I truly wonder at times if, if we really hear it when we flippantly say, God loves us. That's what I want you to focus on today. I always caution people when I mention any sort of a movie, make sure you see the TV version. <clears throat> but I've never been more serious about the TV version than I am when I mention a movie that was put together a number of years ago. Uh, it's a movie called Goodwill Hunting. It's one of the best movies I've ever seen, but the language is not Sunday school approved. <clears throat> so if you can find the TV version, uh, watch the TV version. But it's a movie about a, a young man who has spectacular mathematics skills. He's able to solve problems that his college level professor wouldn't even begin to dream of. Problems that the greatest mathematicians in the world can't solve. He's otherworldly gifted, but abused from the cradle until his early 20s by his father and really held any kind of love at arm's length. And he began uh, to see a, a psychologist played by Robin Williams, who was really amazing in the movie. And Robin Williams just begins to pour into this young man's life, and uh, he couldn't find any other psychologists in town that would uh, listen to him or talk to him because he was just so off-putting and uh, his sarcasm and, and holding really any sort of relational intimacy at arm's length. And towards the end of the movie, you see this wonderful scene where Robin Williams just gently begins to repeat just a, a very simple phrase as he tries to push past all of the hate and all of the reserve and all of the anger that this young man had, had held the world with, had, had held at arm's length so that no one else could get close enough to hurt him again. He just kept saying to him over and over again concerning his father's abuse, it's not your fault. It's not your fault, Will. Somehow, this psychologist who wouldn't allow this young man to push him away was able to push past that tough, rough exterior, was able to push past the sarcasm and all of the defense mechanisms that this young man, Will Hunting, had used to hold everyone in the world away from him, and was able to break through, and some healing started to take place. It's not an accident. It's not a, it's not a mathematical anomaly that all of the young men who have been involved over the past 20 years in school shootings have, have had 
almost no relationship with their father. The statistics are overwhelming. And really most of them have no relationship with any family system at all. They've been passed around here and there. But it reminds us as we hear this wonderful, beautiful message that's so easy to hold out here. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. We are God's children now. You don't have to do anything to earn that. No matter what you've done or where you've been, or what kinds of terrible things you've been involved with, or what kinds of terrible things you've done to others, you are God's child now. There's no sense in going any farther than that. It's really probably bad that the light of Christ just went out as I was telling that, isn't it? That's, I'm going to relight it. We need you now, Jesus. The light of Christ. For oh, now it goes on. Wow, now I'm going to burn the table. Take Jesus and make him well. Bless his heart. He's had a tough day. <laughs> He's coming back again. <clears throat> when you come in and you get him lit, will you say Christ is risen? That'll be fun. Okay. <sighs> Where was I? If we don't get this, if we don't get this whole God loves us thing, we just can't go any farther. And, and when we don't get it, we, we end up fixating on our past failures. And we end up hiding from our future failures, from the fact that there's no chance that we'll ever be what God wants us to be. And we allow our own daddy issues and mommy issues to creep into our relationship with God. And we think there's no way that we can impress God enough to be able to earn what it is that we need to earn. It's just this vicious cycle. And so then we begin to hide from the fact that we can't be what God wants us to be. And so we self-medicate and it just spirals over and over and over again. You've got to be able to hear this. And I don't just mean hear it audibly. I mean, you've got to be able to hear it in the depths of your heart. We are God's children now. Say it with me again. We are God's children now. Just be ready for that. We're, we're going to say it several more times today because I need you to hear it. And I need for us to, to be able to sort of push past some of the reserves that we've had in the past. Is he risen? He is risen. Ah. Uh, wonderful. I'm relieved. I thought I was going to have to do this by myself. We need to be able to push past some of the reserves that we've had in the past. We've been afraid of, of words like meditation. In fact, we've all but given over meditation to, to the, the Eastern monks who practice this transcendental meditation of escapism from the body. We've, we've all but given up one of the most important words that we have, especially in our Old Testament, the idea of, of meditating on who Jesus is. I had an amazing week last week of just being able to take all of the, the post-resurrection stories of Jesus and just, just meditating on what Jesus had done for me and what it meant for Jesus to, to die on the cross and be raised from the dead for me. Just, just being able to, to focus in on that for just a minute every day. God's love for us transforms us. It makes us new. God's love really can change us and make us not just something different, but make us what he wants us to be. So it's going to be really difficult for us to move past this point in 1 John where we are continually called over and over again to love our neighbors, to, to love those around us, to love our brothers and sisters, if we truly have not been transformed by the love of God. We fear our past failures. 
no way that God can love us. Look where we've been, look at the things we've done. Sometimes long after we've been saved, long after we've started living in the church, long after we start living a Christian life, we still remain unhealed by God's love because we've not yet allowed God to love us as he wishes, not yet given him permission to love us in the deepest part of ourselves that we still hide from him. In some ways, because of the things that we've done, we are still Adam and Eve hiding in the garden, hoping that God can't find us and see that we're naked. We still fear our inability to ever achieve what we believe God expects from us in the future. We fear we will ever be able to live up to the expectations that he's placed on us, fearful that we won't be able to live up to the high level of holiness established by those around us, those against whom we compete for God's attention. We attempt to change the rules of the game change the definition of sin to make it easier to avoid, change the definition of holiness to make it easier to attain. But even with these measures, we still feel as if we are falling short of God's future expectations of us. And somehow in the midst of this, somehow in dwelling on the failures of our past and our inability to live up to what we feel to be God's expectations of us in the future, we fail to recognize the fact that we are God's children now. Say it with me. We are God's children now. Does it remind you of a story? There once was a man with two sons. One son only saw his father as, well, basically just a giant wallet. And he came to his father and in essence said, I wish you were dead, can I have my inheritance? And the father somehow, some way, said yes. Gave the man his share, the young man took his share and ventured off into a faraway land and partied away his funds, looking for the love that he'd already had right in his father's home. The young man found himself penniless, began to work in a very difficult environment and one day recognized the fact that even his slaves in his father's home were eating better and were better cared for than he was. So he thought to himself, I'll go home and live as a slave in my father's house. His brother was already living as a slave in his father's house, had never left home, had always been the the favored son, the one who stayed and did the work, but never accepted the love of the father, always lived as a slave in his father's own home. The word prodigal means wasteful. And the fact is that the word prodigal is typically associated with the younger son, but it could be associated with everyone in the story. Think about it. The younger son was wasteful because he took his father's inheritance and wasted it on partying in a land far away. The older son was wasteful because he always had the father's love and wasted every day of his life living as a slave. The father could be seen as wasteful because he wasted his love on two young men that couldn't see it and experience it. If I have to be wasteful, I want to be wasteful in the way that the father is wasteful. I want to be wasteful as the father is wasteful in taking the seeds of love and throwing them everywhere that I possibly can so that people around me could at least possibly experience love if they chose to. The father had two sons. And he loved them both. And neither even knew it. We are God's children now. We don't have to wait for God to choose to love us. We don't have to treat God as just a giant money bag, just just an ATM in the sky, as someone who provides things for us. We can allow him to love us deeply and experience so much more than just the resources that he may pour into our lives. We don't have to be like the older brother and constantly be near God, but never experience his love, always working for it and never experiencing it. We are God's children now. 
in this moment. As the passage continues, we see that, that there is something more than this. It's really the whole message of 1 John, and, and we'll get to that more next week in talking about what's going on in the context of this passage and recognizing the fact that, that there's some teaching that's taking place here that's, that's, that's messing with this whole dynamic. But today, today we don't need to go any farther than that. We've got to be able to get this truth. If we can't get that God loves us now and that we are God's children now, then the next step, the next step of loving our neighbors as ourselves, the next step of, of loving our brothers and sisters around us, the next step of, of ethical purity that comes along with that love that flows through us and into the lives of others around us, well, we'll just find another way to shortcut that. If, if we don't accept and apply the love of God for us, if we don't live as children of the Father, then we'll just find shortcuts to quote unquote loving our neighbors so that we can fulfill the ethical requirements that we feel like God has placed on us in order for us to get into heaven. We've got to be able to hear this truth today. The Father loved both sons neither noticed or appreciated his love. How do you think God feels about you? In fact, I want you to close your eyes just for a second and think about the next couple of questions that I offer you. We're going to do this meditating thing today and see how it works out for us. How do you think God feels about you? God is thinking about you right now. What does he think about you? Do you believe God loves you? Do you think about God loving you? Do you imagine God offering his love to you? can open your eyes. Say it with me one more time. We are God's children now. This was, this was Martin Luther's cry. It, Martin Luther was an, a weird dude. Sometimes I wonder if he wasn't just a little bit too German. And uh, I, I think he may have had just a little bit too much dark German beer when he was writing from time to time because he had regular engagements with the devil. The devil would come into his office in ways that Luther claimed were very real and physical, that he could see the devil in the room. And almost every time he would come in, I can't imagine how many ink pots this man went through, because every time the devil would come into the room, Martin Luther would take his ink pot that he was writing from and throw it across the room. I don't know if he was left-handed, so he might have thrown it the other, he might have thrown it the other way. He would throw his ink pot at the devil and cry out, I am baptized. That was a very physical, real way that Martin Luther could remember that he was God's child. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, baptism is sort of a, a New Testament expression of the, the covenant of God to his people. That, that this was a way that, that God brought his children into his, his kingdom was, was to, to offer us baptism. And, and we are God's children when we experience baptism. Baptism is a, is a physical sign. And we often say that, that baptism is an outward sign of an inward work of grace. And we often think that this is our outward sign of, of the inward grace that we've experienced. The fact is that historically, baptism has been God's outward sign of his acceptance of us, his adoption of us is accepting of us as children and his bringing of us into his family. It is his physical sign that he chooses us before we ever do anything to earn it or deserve it as if we ever could. Baptism is a physical sign that God loves us and accepts us. And here you go, just to make the direct equation for us. Baptism is God's sign 
that we are God's children now. Oh, you want to say it again, don't you? Baptism is God's sign that we are God's children now. If you haven't been baptized yet, man, we're working this thing pretty good over here. We can do it. We can do it right away. But it's a, it's a sign. It's a physical sign for us that helps us remember every single day. And I want to give you something else too. We've not always been very good about using the right kinds of, of ritual or questions or those kinds of things, but we're trying to do a better job of adopting some, some historical tools that have been used in the church for thousands of years. Don't worry. When we do some of these things, they're not Roman Catholic. I, I know that there are reasons for us to have some concerns about that. Most of the practices that we've engaged here predate the Roman Catholic Church by six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. They are Jesus approved. Jesus approved. They, they are not things that we've adopted from another church that we have to distrust. These are things that have been around for thousands of years in the church. And these baptismal practices and these baptismal questions go all the way back to the second and third century. And more than likely before that, they just weren't written down before that. The questions that we used just recently in our baptism on Easter Sunday, these covenant questions that we ask the, the baptismal candidates, these are questions that are designed to help us live into and lean into our baptismal covenant every single day. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. The first question do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Now that sounds a little, a little scary, right? We give him the devil too much credit. The fact is, if we don't name our enemy, we can't vanquish our enemy. And the devil is still at work in the world and the devil is still our enemy. So we name, so we name him so that we can slay him in the power of the spirit. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Yes. I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? The fact is that that sin is not just individualistic. It's not just between me and God and it doesn't have any effect on the rest of the world. When Adam and Eve took the fruit off the tree, something evil poured into the world and still corrupts not just us as individuals, but us as corporate entities. Evil is still at work in the world in ways that we often fail to recognize because we think of sin as such an individualistic thing. If we don't name it, we can't kill it. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? Everything that, that pulls us and shifts us in the wrong way, and we've talked about it before, repentance is, is turning from one direction to another. So if this wall represents my evil, selfish desires, then by claiming my baptismal covenant day in and day out, I am saying over and over and over again, I turn my back on my own desires and I pray with Jesus, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Over and over and over again, we do that. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? Not just evil desires that keep you from having the fun that the world around you tells you that you can have. Did you hear what it said again? Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? The things that keep you from truly being loved by God as he wishes to love you. Yes, I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus and accept him as your savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his love and his grace? Yes, I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? Yes, I do. I'm not going to ask for a poll. I don't want you to say your answers out loud. I don't want anybody to be embarrassed by their low number. But how many times a day do you touch, see, smell, taste, or use water in some way or another? Just think about it for a minute, okay? Just try to think, even this morning, how many times have you come into contact with water? You've used it to cook with, you've used it to clean with, you've used it to shower with, you've used it to brush your teeth with, however many times. I bet it's a bunch. I bet it is a bunch for all of us. All right, 
I'm skipping all decorum. I realize it's not Christmas, but I'm going to use this reference anyway. I triple dog dare you. I triple dog dare you this week. And by the way, all of these questions are on the app. And I can put them in whatever format you need them. I can email them to you. I can write them on a piece of paper and staple them to your shirt if you want me to. But I triple dog dare you to take at least one of these every time you touch, see, smell, use, taste, or shower with, or brush your teeth with water, and, and recite this one more time and say, I renounce them or I do. Rehearse your covenant with God. And I'm challenging you to do that because shortly after we remember and we are reminded that we are God's children now, we hear in the very next verse, when Christ appears, we shall be like him. All, have, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. God wants to make us holy. God wants to make us pure. God wants to cleanse us from within and God wants to love us entirely and God wants to love the world through us. But we as Wesleyan still believe that we play a role in that and you still have to be willing to be a part. And so when this text says all who have this hope in him that we will be found in him and when we see him, we will be like him. The call is very simple. Those who have this hope in him purify themselves as he is pure. And by the way, this whole baptism thing that we do, we are baptized with the same baptism that Jesus was baptized. We are baptized into the baptismal covenant that he made to the Father himself. We share in his baptism and in the same vows that he made. I triple dog dare you this week. Reaffirm your vows with God every single time you touch, see, taste, smell, or use water in any way. And then I also want you to do this. And again, this prayer is available to you both on the app and in any other way that you would like to receive it. I'd be happy to send it to you. This prayer for the candidates that Nick prayed is an ancient prayer. Uh, we had our baptismal candidates on Easter Sunday come down here to the altar and we prayed over them and Nick prayed this prayer which has been around for a long, long time. It's a wonderful, beautiful prayer. I'd love to walk you through all that it means and all that it says, but it's a simple prayer. And I would invite you to pray this prayer for yourself. And I would like to invite you to pray this prayer this week for your friends and family for your brothers and sisters in Christ, for your fellow church members here, I would invite you to pray this prayer. Deliver them, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Open their hearts to your grace and truth. Fill them with your holy and life-giving spirit. Keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. Teach them to love others and the power of the spirit. Send them into the world in witness to your love and bring them to the fullness of your peace and glory. Seven simple phrases, seven simple phrases that you could pray on someone else's behalf to remember that those around you are children of God now, being made whole through his love, maybe being made whole through his love that, he, that they see in you. We are God's children now. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to bow your heads. And in preparation today for communion, I want to offer another tool. God knows us really well. He knows that we are distracted. He knows that we lack focus. He knows that we have many things coming at us every single day, that we have a lot of responsibilities. And he knows that we need physical things, physical signs that remind us of his love. And he's He's taken the opportunity to use two or three of the things that we encounter the most so that we can take the time to stop and slow down and remember that regardless of what we have done and regardless of what we are now and regardless of what we will be in the future, we are his children today. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of his great love for us that he has lavished us. 
not only did he use water as a sign of his covenant to us, of his eternal love for us, of his setting us apart as his children, but he has also made an offer of his eternal fellowship with us through another thing that we do fairly often. I don't know about you, but I eat at least three times a day. And God has used just a a simple thing like a meal to remind us of his love for us, that he sent Jesus to love us, to live before us, to give himself up for us, to die on the cross for us, to be raised from the dead for us, and then to eat meals with us, even after he was raised from the dead, so that we might experience his eternal life and forgiveness from sin and newness in his resurrected body. And he uses a meal to remind us of that. So I wanna challenge you again this week. Every time you sit down to eat, or even in those mad scrambles when you're eating breakfast over the kitchen sink, or you're, you're eating a burger on the way to work, or you're having to grab dinner in a, in, a, in a dash, I challenge you to stop and to think about what it is that we do here on Sunday mornings and allow the thought of a meal to be a reminder that God always invites us to his table. And that this table is a reminder that Jesus is both our gracious hope, our gracious host, always inviting us to dine with him, and also our meal. He is also bread and the fruit of the vine for us, providing all the strength and all the purity and all the love that we will ever need. I'm just going to give you a a couple of minutes this morning. We're doing great on time, and if you're staying here for lunch, you're, you're going to beat the Baptist to the cafeteria, so there's no rush. I want you to think about, I want you to pray about, I want you to imagine, and I want you to ask God to help you imagine how he loves you through this meal that we're about to share. Maybe you've never stopped to think about it, but how does God show his love to you as he invites you to this table this morning? He's standing here in our midst today. Jesus is here among us. He's inviting you to this table today. And he's saying to you, I love you. I died for you. I am raised again by the power of the Father for you, and I long to eat with you and fellowship with you today. You see him? Do you hear him? As those who are coming to serve today are are coming to prepare the table, will you pray with me? Jesus, we remember the night that you were betrayed, the night that you shared a meal with your disciples. We remember that you took the bread and you broke it and you said to your disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it, and every time you do, remember me until I come again. Jesus, we remember that same night that you took the cup, you blessed it, and you said to your disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Will you take it and drink it, and every time you do, remember me until I come again.
Father, we ask just now that you will send your Holy Spirit down upon these simple items of bread and the fruit of the vine and make them for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also ask today, Father, through the precious presence of your Holy Spirit, that you will take this meal and that you will make it for us a meal of unity, that you will draw us and bind us closer together, and that we will remember today through this meal, precious Holy Spirit, as you hover over us and as you gather us together, will you help us to remember that as we have said over and over and over again today, we are God's children now. That that we is really important. As we begin to look around and share this meal together today, will you draw us not only to your love as individuals, but will you draw us collectively? And in the days to come, will you continue to heal us by your love and help us to love one another? <coughs> we are grateful today for this meal. We pray now that you would draw us into your fellowship and that you would bless this meal together for us. Amen. Will you stand and come and receive Christ's body and his blood? May you be loved by this meal today.
In asking such a thing, I know I am overbold, but I dread what is threatened when you say to me, if I do not wash your feet, I have no fellowship with you. Wash my feet then, Jesus, because I long for your companionship. Amen. Will you stand?